Welcome to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. Your host, a behavioral scientist and bachelor, talks to leading experts and successful singles about living solo and living well. Travel more, make things, sleep in when you want to. Here's the playbook for the person who is unapologetically unattached. Now, please welcome Dr. Peter McGraw. Welcome back to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. I'm Peter McGraw. This is part two of a fun, fascinating conversation with Marty Hazelton, an evolutionary psychologist, and Shane Moss, a comic who is a student of evolutionary psychology. If you haven't listened to part one, stop here and please listen first. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Let's get started with part two. So is it the case that this sort of rise of single yeah. culture, mm-hmm. let's talk about it in those sort of terms, mm-hmm. is likely to be kind of an overriding, is it being, is culture overriding, technology and culture and the intersection and development of those things overriding what might typically be an evolutionary drive? Or yeah. is there... Vi- like I, again, I am not an expert in this, mm-hmm. but are there varied sort of? I um I think probably both of the things that you're saying are true. Okay. So I think that that we are equipped with the way that the way that my PhD mentor put it was a menu of sexual strategies. Yes, and okay, so, you good. know you can kind of look through the menu and decide which of those you're going going to pursue. Now, of course, the way to think about it from a from a functional and evolutionary perspective is to think about what kind of environment you're in, what kind of problem you're facing, and then what sort of mate choice makes sense from that, or no mate choice yes. makes sense from that. So if you are the the woman who's paired with a, uh, who's a five, who's paired with another mate who's a five, and you get that 10 opportunity, that is that is a particular kind of context that's going to yield one mating strategy. A, a different context altogether would be that Okay, let's say that you're the five and the five, but for either of you to leave that relationship, you would be in some sort of peril. Maybe, maybe you are in that relationship living very close to so the some margin. threat of violence somebody and leaves, so on. Yeah, th- yes. threat of violence. Um, somebody leaves them. They, it's complete economic collapse mm-hmm. of the family and so on. Yes. So, you, you marry a gambling addict. <laughs> Get um, out. Yeah. So. And then foregoing reproduction so that you can work on growing up and growing, you know, growing a strong, large body, maybe achieving some modicum of status in your environment. And so you're not trying to conquer the mating problem at that particular point in time, but rather you have the motivation to increase your social standing. Um, So we have competing motivations and sometimes they, they, we can trade them off at various points in our lives and then do sort of check all those boxes eventually or maybe one of the mate one of those motivations just overrides overrides yes. or it wins out so there there one is no less um evolved than the other it's just that we have a variety of motivations um and then you add to that some cultural innovations like birth control mm-hmm. and and like the ability to um inherit wealth so we're not so dependent on another individual yes. for for, and and acquiring wealth ourselves. Yeah, the right to vote, access to education, yeah. all of the things that you've seen in terms of the rise of of women economically, mm-hmm. especially in the United States, right. right? Which has allowed greater freedom and choices mm-hmm. that exist. So, in in a previous episode, we we tried to answer the question, "What is a remarkable life?" And I I put forth a model that I like to use, um, which is Martin Seligman's PERMA model, hmm. in terms of you know, what are the goals that you have in terms of living a good life? So, you know, our evolutionary ancestors, to my knowledge, didn't have the pursuit of creativity as something that drove them as much as it is today, right? Making a podcast, making art, and so on. I think they're making art and dancing. Yeah, Yeah, maybe. I mean, it was still impressive, right? Show off your big brain. Um, Impress a mate. Yeah, but, but... if, yeah, but if indeed, but I don't think that that the pursuit of engagement is in the perma model. That's the E mm-hmm. has to be to to get laid, right? That it's Not satisfying in of itself. Well, that it can be satisfying in itself. That you mm-hmm. can do it as a as a yeah. as a hermit, and um and be compelled by it. 
I mean, I mean, I think that I think that when birds um, dance, uh, that I mean, from our point of view, it's like, well, that bird is clearly impressing this female. But from their point of view, it might just be like, I don't know what it is. I just love dancing okay. with right. ladies. Okay, are, that's fine. That's fine. Are, 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 but but certainly the opportunities <laughs> to engage in art and creative activities are infinite now because of of language, for example, and so on. Hmm. Right. Apes can't write poems. Yeah. But, but they can have use language creative for a long tool time. use and stuff. Okay, that's fair. Press. Um, okay. But all right. But, but the, but part of the point of this, mm. though, are these goals mm-hmm. which get crowded out by these parasitic children <laughs> yeah. to use someone else's term. <laughs> yeah. So the, um, right. So the idea essentially is we have limited resources mm-hmm. in yeah. the yeah. world. And yep. then if you do pair bond and have your 2.5 children, mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be the case. It doesn't have to be zero sum, but it crowds out some of these other activities that are enjoyable. Yeah. But, and, and that might be building a business, right? Mm-hmm. You know, like it's harder to do science. Yeah. You know, when you have to split time between your lab and a family. Right. So, so the question might be, why are those things enjoyable in the first place? And so how did it come to be the case that our species was so interested in displaying their creative intelligence? Mm -hmm. Um, And might that have been, might that have evolved because it actually achieved us some status. It achieved us some, some attractiveness in the eyes of others. And so it actually in those evolved, in those, ancestral environments it would have resulted in greater chances of reproduction that, that's fair hold i on, mean before you go on before you say this so i i get that mm-hmm. but at some point as we as like has yeah. to clearly be the case is that these things become disconnected right in the same way that right. you masturbate for the for pleasure not you know what i mean that you may write poems for the pleasure sure. of writing poems right. so rather once, than once having children. Once the pleasure children. machinery is there, then we will exploit it however we can. Yeah, or whether the status machinery is there, right? Mm-hmm. I want to build a business, but I'm not doing it because, mm-hmm. right? You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. so the idea essentially is that, I mean, c- correct me if I'm wrong, there's a great irony here, hmm. which is let's suppose you you do pursue remarkable things, Okay. And as a result of it, you become a more appealing mate. (laughs) Yeah. Right. You know, so you're not playing video games, you're playing guitar, Mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you're, uh, you're not watching, you know, you're not watching football, you're building a business, right. You know, these kinds of things. Um, and, uh, you know, you're seeing the world, you're doing, you know, like you, you, Mm -hmm. you're, you're doing things that create status that make you interesting and, um, maybe you weren't even doing it for that reason, or maybe mm-hmm. you were doing it for that reason. I joke that a lot of men do a lot of things just to be appealing to women. Mm-hmm. But um, but suppose you're just doing for pure interest. And then, because you become more appealing, you can get that 10 rather than the 5. Mm-hmm. And then you pair up. Mm-hmm. And then the pressure either becomes, oh, I can't do all these things, mm-hmm. or your partner goes, why are you traveling all the time? Why are you writing all these poems? You know what I mean? Uh-huh. And that there's this sort of irony in that. Yeah, I mean that's sense. that's very, that's a very interesting point. I mean, my podcast, here we are, I go around interviewing scientists and if you were to ask me where this drive came from, I would tell you that like I mean the only really related mating stuff was that I was confused about trying to understand like new relationships and why I went through a breakup, understanding why I do the things that I do, but but then more generally, I'm just really curious. I want to know more. I've always been really um, curious about life and was also frustrated by my religious upbringing. It didn't make sense to me. I give you all these reasons. And then, and I would never say that I'm doing it to get laid, but I do also cast like a pretty nice net out there. And there are like listeners that sometimes come to shows that are like attractive women that are like, really, we think in, in much the same way. We have the same interests. And so it is tough to say like, well, that's just a nice little byproduct. When you look around at every other species and see that like most of that kind of artistic stuff seems very, very related to 
Um, yeah, I'm buying, uh, to, I'm buying both of yours argument, right? I, I'm certainly taking a, I'm going to take a strong approach here. Mm-hmm. Um, because I have a lot of data that suggests that people aren't, as you keep using the term pair bonding the way they used to. Right. And so, so mm-hmm. there, there may be these incentives to, to become, to build resources or to work out, to look good and to eat well and to do all these kinds mm-hmm. of things. There are these sort of proximal reasons to do this, which right. is I eat well and I work out to fuel my body in a way to feel good, to excel in the work that I do, to live a more pleasurable, engage, mm-hmm. energetic life. Mm-hmm. It may ha- also have this effect of be- making me 5% more attractive than mm-hmm. it would be otherwise. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And so, and, but my point is, is that these things can become they're sort of as we've moved away from our ancestral past they become more disconnected you know like you don't they they do in terms of their in terms of the the connection from you know the causal connection from a to b yes. that is you become more attractive and then you have more offspring but but in terms of the motivation okay. and understanding where the motivation came from um you know can That's we really fair. say that that doesn't have anything to do with mating if that was the the feedback yes. that throughout our evolutionary history produced that creative motivation That's was fair. that it actually did result in okay. greater reproduction okay 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 that's fine hold on hold on because that's fine except we don't just exist to procreate. Oh, okay, well, we need to survive long enough to procreate. And then, no, no, and then no, it's also I mean, inclusive fitness, which is taking care of your I, young. What I'm saying is that like you can make, obviously we make decisions to not procreate. Men get vasectomies, women, women get IUDs. You know, we also have people who are not engaged in heterosexual sex mm-hmm. and, you know, and so on. And so, so that that may underlie our motivations, and and it certainly shapes our culture. There's no doubt that it shapes our culture, um, and the things that we are sort of become more interested in, and so on. But again, it's my argument is it's not the primary goal for. Lest I remind you, both you and I are evolutionary dead ends. So this is all well and nice to talk about now, but if we if if we then like if humans evolve enough of a psychology to be like, yeah, these things are too costly. Uh, now that I have this, uh, th- these systems that have been built to like be artistic or be creative or be remarkable or whatever, now I'm going to go off and do that for my own sake. Well, it might be the people that. You know, in future generations, do have kids are the ones that just didn't share that same prefer- preference. So that might shape our our future preferences as well. Otherwise, there's just not going to be anyone here. Like if anyone if anyone takes our our same approach, you know, the world will will empty out in a hurry. Obviously, we're a long ways from that. And, yeah, we don't have enough listeners. And, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> but but I I do think that the the amazing. I mean, I think humans are the most flexible species on Earth. Um, in term and in incredible tool makers and everything else. And then in terms of mating, it's the same way. And so, but then you have these environmental, these cultural influences where you take an area where, say, like, females have been being aborted for a long time, so there's more men than than there are women, you might make a prediction that that the men there are going to have to be more competitive, whether they're more violent or whether they're conspicuously uh, uh, consuming things more and, and at, trying to stand out by spending more money. And then, and then you have, like, these bizarre mating habits of, like, a female having two husbands and it turns out that this only happens in these rare cases when the the environment is is very uh, the the food is scarce and usually it's brothers and so so these are like this is just another human being and you could plop pretty much any human being into this environment and evolution's built so many different tools that just one of these will come online and it's possible that you you know that people like you and i which I can tell you in terms of it, it, um, um, intelligence being a way of advertising yourself, being from Wisconsin and knowing like uh, that that people can get just uh, get by just fine with a very limited vocabulary, you know, and do all the things. It does seem like there's an additional 
um, uh, kind of unnecessary cost of like learning all of these new words. And it seems like someone like my, myself or you, uh, you know, we're, we're in LA. I'm in comedy. You're trying to write, but we're doing things to stand out. Um, and so, and so there's these adaptive features that are kind of coming online for the very specific environment that we're in right now, but it's, it's still evolved, I, I would say. That's fair, but I mean, we have, to, I think we have to be careful. And Marty, I really want to hear what you mm-hmm. think about this. We have to be careful about saying adaptive is good. Oh yeah. Right. Because that's definitely, that's definitely a trap. Yeah. So, so right. So logically incoherent, sh- you know, sweet, sweet things were really mm-hmm. good for us back in the day. And mm-hmm. now they're not so good for us right. because the world has changed. And then the, the open question I think is children were good for us yeah. back yeah. in the day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the question is, do they continue to be good for us? Oh and, yeah. And my thing is it's not no one should have children. Right. My argument, and and I and, my, and no one should get married. My argument is it's over prescribed. Oh yeah. And so what I want to I offer agree people, with you one thousand <laughs> yeah. percent. Bless your heart, Peter McGraw. Yeah. I, just I, offer, I try to say the same thing to as many people as I can. Believe what I want to do is offer an alternative to some person who it doesn't feel right to mm-hmm. do this. They don't feel the pull. To uh-huh. have a family. Right. They're not so good at relationships. They envision their relationships as being more short term, mm-hmm. to be more focused on, as you say, short term mating and pleasure, that they're more varied, whatever those things are, that that is just because back in the day it was adaptive to do this. Yeah. It's not necessarily. Well, you know what? I don't even think. Hmm. I mean, saying back in the day, it was, I mean, it, it could have been that for any individual or for any particular slice in time, executing the adaptations that served the, the cumulative the, history of the ancestors of the before them. Yes. Yeah. Um, it didn't result in a good outcome. Indeed. Maybe it got you killed. You know, it, uh, you know, mating is one of the most hazardous things you can do. So you can get a disease. You can accidentally mate with somebody who's already taken and get killed. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's you know you can die in childbirth. Um, you know there are there are all kinds of things That's that, that terrible things that can happen to you. Um, so um, for any one individual, I don't think that we could ever you know say this will be adaptive in in that you know in the way that I think we tend to colloquially use the word. Please, yeah. Um, and so. I think that kind of all bets are off about whether something's currently adaptive or not. I think we just kind of need to take that, take that part off of the table and just ask, you know, how do we understand the motivations that we are equipped with? And I think an evolutionary perspective is going to be very important for those. And then how do we understand, um, given those motivations, um, and given our, our motivational systems tied to pleasure, you know, how can we achieve whatever it is we decide? as individuals living in this current environment, we want to achieve best. And in some cases, maybe it is getting, uh, ha- finding a mate and, and having children. In some cases, maybe it's something else entirely. Mm-hmm. But I think that if we understand where, if we, under, if we can sort of, um, if we, if we can reverse engineer our motivations, then we have more control over them. That's great. I, I'm so glad you said that because what I think a lot of solo listeners... And I just would say by, by having more control over them so we can decide whether when we feel like a particular impulse or a nudge, whether we want to understand that as something that maybe served our, ancest- our ancestors in the past, doesn't serve us now, or, and how to maximally exploit our pleasures now, given the way our, our, our minds are designed. That's great, because I think one of the things that I think the average li- solo listener struggles with is that they are in the minority. Right. And, and so in, and, and it looks one of two ways is like maybe eventually you are going to, I like to say for now or forever, right? You're single for now or forever. And so what I think this conversation helps to do is explain the pressure that's, um, that's very clearly there mm-hmm. where it's the, it's the default. Mm-hmm. It's the assumption. It's the question you get. Mm-hmm. And, and when you, answer non-normatively right the surprise and the pushback that you get what you're describing is that 
this this sort of you know our evolutionary background has pushed you know we still are very much connected to that yeah although and and we may very we may be motivated to get into other people's business because a lot of what you just said was about the social pressures to mate and have kids um and so why would anybody care what anybody else is doing and why would you get this question every thanksgiving yes. right but it's because your kin have an interest in seeing you do things that um would potentially replicate their genes which they share with you so no, it's not nothing none of this is in our explicit conscious mind but but rather if you know you're encouraging them to find a partner you know if you're encouraging steering them toward particular kinds of partners who look like they might be good mates and helpful in rearing children um should it come to that by the way it's friends too can do this also yeah absolutely i, I have friends whose wives mm-hmm. are like Pete, I I worry about you. Aww. I'm worried. <laughs> I always feel like it's just justifying their own. I, well, crap. I, yeah, I know. Uh, I mean, so so they may not be sharing your your genes, but but you but you have a commentary on what on the strategies that they have chosen by not choosing to do those things yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like I, yeah. an attack on what they do so, almost. So I think that's but, a useful idea. Were you oh, say I I was just going to think that because this goes back to a question you asked Marty uh, uh, much earlier on, and I would have. Uh, uh, I love to answer too because it affects my life just like how it does learning any of this stuff actually help you in your day-to-day behavior um and i think that uh it, you know much in the way that that i i used to have horrible road rage issues i don't have anything like it anymore maybe i've just gotten older but i think that it was deeply connected with like really understanding the stress response system and now able to tell myself like Oh, the thing that I'm feeling right now is this response that was adapted for other things like running from a lion or something like that. And it's just a complete uh, inappropriate yeah. signal and erroneous signal right now. And it's hurting and, me. And it's hurting me yes. and I can cool down and, and, and someone that's mindful like th- this can be like, God, I want to kill my kids right now. Oh, that's just my adapted thing of like, <laughs> this is this, uh, this is this frustration where you want to take control over a situation or you're, or you're, or, or you're becoming hyper aware of the cost. Whereas like, if you're aware of that, Certainly don't you, wouldn't you much rather want to be, I, I think that you have a, you have a chance of cooling yourself down more than gem. someone that's this just is, like, this is an amazing, oh, I want to kill my kids. So maybe I should kill my insight. kids. You know, the, yeah. like yeah, m- most people you- are just following whatever they're like thoughts or or whatever are guiding them towards without ever questioning and them. Anytime or, we're having conflict with somebody else and we could sort of like instantaneously shoot messages back and forth with that person. Yeah. That's just it's just and but if we recognize that 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 we are we're responding as if, you know, it's we're gonna yeah. we're gonna die if we don't if we don't respond to this giant stressor. Yeah, yeah. Um then if we recognize that that there's a big mismatch between what we're doing right now in this moment where we're trying to work something out with somebody we have conflict mm-hmm. with versus what we would have encountered in the ancestral past, then I think we can, you know, put it down, call the person back, whatever. Yeah. yeah. You know? And and then away. also understanding that like why we might not be perceiving the actual threats today. Like we haven't adapted very well for like really having a sense of the like, global warming issues yes. is something that you like need to train yourself to understand. We don't, we don't have any, we don't have any tools to really comprehend what like global warming feels like, you know, not a specific threat in the moment. Right. And, and in that, in that same, uh, in that same way, boy, I have concerns about overpopulation. I would love if birth control and vasectomies and everything else were just free for everyone that wanted that wanted yes, them. I I'm very much for the solo life. But I, I think becoming mindful of these, these evolved pressures and biases and preferences can, if you choose to, help you break free of them or, or pause a moment before deciding whether to take action on a given drive yeah i i think this idea i mean this is this is enlightening because i think that these effects are um obviously they're very real and profound and they and they it, i like this idea of like telling your aunt at thanksgiving to stop acting like a monkey <laughs> when she's asking you why you're not dating someone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's going to go over well. <laughs> you're like, I'm a great ape. Stop acting like <laughs> So, um, 
I'd like to do a few um, a few things here, a little bit more rapid fire. Lightning um, round. Yeah, so I have some <laughs> questions that I want to ask, and then I just have a few topics that I feel like are probably lingering in the air for a few for a few listeners. So, so Marty, one of the um, what, you know, one of the things that comes up a lot is homosexuality, mm-hmm. right? So, one yeah. of the things is a lot of single solo people. Uh, maybe gay or lesbian, yeah. you know what I mean, and right. not and not doing a traditional marriage and mm-hmm. and so on. And so, what is the kind of evolutionary view in terms yeah. of this? Well, so there are there are lots of sexual orientations out there, and yes. and so there 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 might very well be different ev- evolutionary explanations for each of them. So, male exclusive male male homosexuality. So we can start there. Okay. Um, one possible exp- so you know this is an evolutionary puzzle so this is a prime example of something that is a puzzle it doesn't make sense from an evolutionary perspective it definitely reduces the number of offspring that you're going to produce mm-hmm. and yet there appears to be at least some at least a partial genetic foundation so it runs in families in some interesting ways and so on so how is this happening so how do we understand how genes can continue can s- continue to exist and not be selected out um, these genes for homosexuality or that that make one um, susceptible to feeling this way. And one possibility, this and this is the best evolutionary explanation I think we have so far, at least in terms of what's been supported, is that the same genes when they are present in a man have the effect of making him like men a lot enough to forego opportunities with women. Those same genes when they are present in his mother or his sisters make her that much more interested in men. I see. So it has a favorable impact on the female relatives in the family and it for the male relatives in the family makes them gay. Okay. And so the genes are themselves being selected for and perpetuated through generations because they have a favorable effect on one family member but not the other. That's interesting. Yeah, so so we can understand its its genetic basis and its evolutionary foundation, but it's more complex than thinking about, you know, how are those guys reproducing? Mm-hmm. It's instead how are, what's happening with their family members. I see, that's interesting. Yeah, to me again, I I like to point that to, again in terms of the varied Yeah. And for for women, um I think sexual orientation, so sexual orientation appears to be set and not terribly fluid in men whereas for women it can vary a lot over the course of their lives. So it's a different phenomenon and it probably has a different explanation. Um you know, women being more open in their in their sexuality than men Lots of possibilities there. Um, one is that uh, women may have had to reside in households with other wives throughout some of our I evolutionary see. past. And so maybe that makes women a little bit more flexible so that there can be more more getting along than there might be otherwise. Yeah. I, I asked this question in part because it, it does seem like a puzzle given the kind of assumptions that we started with mm-hmm. at the beginning of the podcast. Mm-hmm. And then also, um, this is a group of people who I think... Yeah. Generally are living a more right. solo mm-hmm. lifestyle, although obviously, yeah. you know, we're, we're, you know, um, fortunately have now have the choice to get married mm-hmm. if they want to in, in right. many places. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a, a, a question from a, um, listener, um, that's related to this. It says, I identify as aromantic mm-hmm. and asexual. Mm-hmm. How does evolutionary sciences view those who don't have the, "Quote unquote natural urge to procreate. Whatever evolutionary functions might we play? Well, um, I mean, so we just, we're getting back to this issue of you know the thinking about the adaptiveness of the, of a single person's behavior. At yeah, that's point true. In time. And right. so, but you know, so asexuality is actually something we've started studying in my lab. And so asexuality is not being not just so it's like your sexual desire is present. Um, in these people, so the, 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 you know, the engine is turned on, or it's like being hungry, you know, you feel hungry, but then you look at the menu and nothing looks good. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, and that, that's asexuality. Aromantic is, I, we, I know a lot less about that. And sometimes people are both, but I think that's re- relatively rare. A lot of times. What is aromantic? Aromantic just means you're not particularly interested in having a partner of any sort. I see. Whether you're having sex with that partner or not. So some asexual individuals will actually have, um, so a young woman who, um, who I, I know, know a lot UCLA. of married people who are like this. Well, a young woman I know at UCLA who identifies as asexual, she's got a boyfriend, you know, but so but that is her romantic partner, which is different from 
her having a traditional sexual relationship with that partner. She's just not really that interested. Now, she might do it because he's interested. Yes, I see. Um, but there's a term for this. Um, compliant sex? Is that's, that the I term? Don't think that's, I, I think it would be... If it's if it's uh, service sex or something like oh, that. Both no? of those don't sound very nice. <laughs> <laughs> service sex? Um <laughs> Gift sex, maybe. I think service is like uh, gift, gift sex would be a f- more fun, it'd be, it'd be, like it'd be nice, affectionate sounding, like, sex. Maybe it's because the other yeah. person desires Caring it, and you want I to get along. I think there's a term as service. Sex. But I, 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 I was going that. to, I was going to say that, um, that you know, again, going back to the flexibility of a species, you take, you take something like conscientiousness, and and you take two people like me. It's there's going to be tremendous costs to being as low in conscientiousness as I am. You take someone like Pete, you're going to end up having probably some anxiety. Your friends are going to think you're a little overboard with the shoes at the door thing sometimes. And so there's going to be like some, some cost there as well. Most people fall in the middle. So there's like sex addicts yes. that like can't stop banging as many people. And then there's asexuals. Right. Most people fall in the middle. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's sort of clear hmm. to me, especially if you spend any time on the apps and especially if you've, you've surveyed a, ver- a wide variety of these apps is that the um, proclivities and what people identify as and what they're interested in is more varied than ever. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know how much of that is that, it, that we now have more transparency and how much of this is sort of fulfilling this, right? It's giving people license. Then they start experimenting. Oh, I kind of like this. And then they um, they develop sort of new preferences as a, re- as a result of that. Um, let's keep going with a couple more. So, this one's for Shane. So Shane, you taught me about the mate expulsion hypothesis. Yeah, it's one of my favorite things to think about. I mean, sometimes, sometimes I get, I, I, you know, as as I'm not a scientist, I can gravitate towards some of the more speculative things that aren't necessarily as backed up by data, and and, and I also. Um, don't mind applying things to my own personal life. And I find it to be as, as someone who's been a serial monogamous who genuinely has gone into like relationship after relationship, like you said, like deeply in love with this person. Like I found the one. Oh my God. And then, and like legitimately wanting this to be like my life partner. You know, it was part of my frustration. I was like, why does it start that way? Why isn't it working out? Why, you know, and, uh, and this idea of this made up, a made expulsion of, uh, there, there's some species of bird that does do like full pair bonding, doesn't fool around and stuff. And then the only time they break up is if, uh, they get together and they don't have, they don't have eggs. So they're genetically incompatible. That doesn't, doesn't mean that they aren't compatible with others. It doesn't mean that they're they fertile. Like the same just, movies. just one, uh, <laughs> I'm just saying it doesn't mean that they can't, br- it doesn't mean I one see. of them sterile. It just means that together they're uh, incompatible. So evolution probably figured out some sort of internal mechanism to drive them apart so that they would break up and go and find other mates because otherwise you wouldn't pass your genes on if you didn't do that. And so the idea is applying this to a modern world where all of a sudden there's birth control so you're banging it out for that is a science term too by the way (laughs) for like a for like a year or so and you should there should certainly at least be signs of pregnancy by this point you know you might have missed a few windows Mm -hmm. here and there but there should be something Mm -hmm. and so is it much in the same way that these birds don't know that like oh we're genetically incompatible so i guess that's that they're they're probably like he doesn't wipe off his feet before he gets in the nest he's like i'm trying to put worms (laughs) on the table you know that's probably what it feels like a little bit to them it's fun little probably anthropomorphizing a bit much but um it's probably a little bit something like that and so humans are maybe You know, a year goes by or two years goes by. There's no babies. There's no babies. Maybe there's these psychological pressures like, I got to get away from this person. This guy's a slob. And and it certainly models all of my... It doesn't mean that it's true. It does, and it doesn't also. And even if it is true, it doesn't mean that it's an explanation for for my life. There could be a variety of other things, Mm -hmm. but 
um, boy, does it model my pet, not, not just my personal life, like getting along with someone, but also the sex and everything else, the, the way that it changes. Like after that first year, then the second year is always like, okay, some problems bubbling up. Third year is always a nightmare. Marty, what, you're smiling. Well, What's the I'm smiling this? because this is one of my favorite evolutionary mysteries. And that is why does anybody stay together if they don't have kids? Because they should be, I mean, this should be, a, a major alarm that goes off in the head mm-hmm. that says you need to find a different mate. You are not reproducing. Now, granted, we may have made a conscious decision, sure. I- any of us, um, to to not reproduce. But 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 you got to remember that that you know what we want and what our brains are telling us to do aren't necessarily the same thing. Um, and so, throughout our evolutionary history, the alarm bell that gets you to expel your mate and choose another one would have been the thing that that would have been selected for and retained so why is it that we do stick together as much as we do i think that's a really interesting mystery so what but but it shouldn't it be the case that there are as as shane was just talking about you know a normal distribution around people who right there should Mm -hmm. be natural individual differences in for example how pleasurable sex is Mm -hmm. and how much like Mm -hmm. you know how pleasurable cuddling is how pleasurable like commitment is yeah and so that could explain some of it right some of it yeah right and if there's enough variance out in the yeah i just you know there are just a lot of people who choose not to have kids and stay apparently happy for a very long time well okay hold on apparently but for hold on on you're assuming that having kids makes you happy. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm yeah, not. No. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, they don't, they don't, they so that, don't get, that's, they don't that's get the out of darkest the thing okay. of the whole thing that's is a, there's yeah. no, there's no answer to this puzzle. Yes. Having kids isn't going to solve much of anything. I mean, cause like, you know, plenty of kids the break number up after one they reason have kids. Of divorce is financial stress, right? Yeah. And what, what creates financial stress? No, kids. Right. Is having kids, yeah. right? So, I mean, so the fact is that but people that, stay this, together is, a, is surprising to me. No, reason that, but this is a reason that is hidden from our conscious awareness. The financial stress we're aware of that, right? Everybody's looking at the bank books. Um, whereas you know this this sort of you know uncomfortable feeling that we have with a mate after a little while of having regular sex with them and no offspring. But is there appear. data that suggests that that's indeed the case? Do we know that that's we know what happens in birds? But oh, do we have do data we know that, that people lose interest over the course of their of their relationships and their partners? Yes, I mean there's a honeymoon period and then no, no, no. But but that's but away. that is the same whether you have children or not, right? So the idea that made made expulsion hypothesis yeah. suggests that there no kid shows up and then you go, I must reject, mm-hmm. right? Because but you're but, but the, then if you have kids. if you have kids, then you go, oh, this is a good match. Let's just keep this rolling, right? Mm-hmm. Right, but then there's other considerations there too, I right? Know. Okay. You know, because kids are stressful and financially stressful, yes, they and are, all of so that too. Yes, you know, so you have to include all of those variables. I know. In Plus, there's just the roommate problems. situation. I, I mean, I mean, I really like living with a female. Like, I will move in, uh, <laughs> like third date. Like, hey, ready? Yeah, let's get together. But that, uh, you know, uh, there's still no matter how much you like that. There's still the like. Now you got a roommate, you know. Now you're seeing this person. Shane's high on the cuddling scale. I'm obviously. way high on the cuddling Aww, scale. That's so sweet. <laughs> but but now but now you have you have a room. So so bonding, pair bonding, having a children. These might have all been favored by uh, by evolution, but there's still like and and humans are exceptionally social. But then there's still other pressures of like the more time that you spend. And having to see this person like day in and day out, the more you're necessarily probably going to like get on in one another's this, nerves this and is, stuff. This is perfect because um, Luis asks a question. Mm-hmm. Um, she says, my question is, given this, given that single person households with the standard of living that we have, i.e. we live alone when we can afford it, um, are humans really the social creatures we have been painted as? And so I, I think if I can interpret this question... Um, I would, I would rephrase it as, um, obviously humans are social creatures. How much of our socialness has to do with needing to survive and having some familial unit, mm-hmm. right? To keep mm-hmm. us safe, to keep us warm, till the land and so on. That when you don't have the needing to keep alive allows us to express a greater 
variety of preferences with regard to how social we like to be or want to be. Yeah. And it cha- I mean, the landscape changed in like this unforeseen, like evolutionary. Uh, this is another thing evolution could have never seen coming is the internet. This woman questioning whether we need to be social is being social, like <laughs> through yeah. internet and able yes. to reach out to yeah. you and ask you yeah. this in question. In a very weak tie kind of way. And, 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 you know, whether you are cohabiting with someone, you know, that you could be more social and be living alone because you have, you know, because you're spending all of your time out with friends. Thank you for bringing that up because yeah. that that came up in episode two. I, I talked to um, Bella DePaulo, who's- Oh, more... I'm so glad you talked to her. Oh, I was going to suggest it. She's yeah. great. And one of the things that this found is that single people are often more interconnected mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because one is the- the, the sort of need, right? That, mm-hmm. you know, that, that you don't have just one person who you can rely on mm-hmm. for a variety of mm-hmm. things, but also then you have opportunity, mm-hmm. right? It's not, there's no one to be threatened by the fact that, you know, yeah. you're going out a lot. And, and you're not stuff. just going to be social by default. You're going to be social by plan. And so maybe that's going to lead to a different kind of social life anyway. Yes. Um, you know, you got to make those plans. You got to get together and go out and do something. But I think the, I, po- the point in this question that underlies this question is there was a time where it was, nearly impossible to live alone right and so even if you had sort of a predisposition let's say you're a disagreeable person right so disagreeable people are hard to live with Mm -hmm. and so you know and so you're disagreeable and so you're just like okay i'm just gonna live on my own you know or you have something quirky about yourself Mm -hmm. you know whatever that might be now you can yeah I mean, as someone who spends more time alone than certainly anyone in this room and certainly most people on earth that aren't truck drivers, maybe. I mean, I spend so much time by myself and I'm very happy to like when, especially the touring comedian, he basically is home free right now. Yeah. And, and when I used to stay in hotels and I stay in Airbnbs, but in hotels, I would often like, be getting a room service and stuff and like not even going out i wouldn't see people for like days sometimes consciously Mm -hmm. absolutely loved it like that was consciously my happy place that was like Mm -hmm. by design and then i realized that i'd have to force myself to like go out and go to restaurants and interact because there were these other like like depression would start bubbling up and i'd be like what's this gonna so i just had to do trial and error experimenting with it so so you so you might be able to um you, you know you might not you might be able to go solo um easier than ever but there might be like these underlying little warning signs that that express themselves in like depression or anxiety that that pop up and and you don't necessarily are you're never able to connect the dots you know to what it what it's from yeah and i i've been fussing around with this this saying about solo but not alone yeah, yeah. You I know, like like that I, I don't think this is not mm-hmm. this is not a podcast for hermits or missing. Oh, you're a very mm-hmm. social person. You're a more social person than I am by a long shot. Pete, mm-hmm. Pete's uh, Pete's exceptionally outgoing. Like if we when we leave here, mm-hmm. um, we're gonna uh, maybe ha- have a quick bite together. Yes, and Pete will be like making conversation with the waiter and everything, and then we'll like get in an elevator to leave. And if there's someone else in the elevator, Pete will like start up a conversation <laughs> with someone in it that we're going to be in an elevator with for 15 seconds i would never dream of doing <laughs> such a thing this happened so, the other day i asked someone i was like are you famous she looked famous <laughs> so i asked if she was famous yeah so 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 this is just a testament of uh, of like yeah, yeah, you you aren't this this podcast isn't necessarily about being a hermit yeah it's just because it's called solo that's right um let me do two more and then we'll we'll wrap up we're not doing any bonus material today just because we've gone We've gone longer than I would normally and and thus don't need it. Plus, this has already been so good. Who how do we top it with bonus <laughs> material? So, Marty, I wanna I have one for you and then one for Shane. Um so when I was first researching this podcast, I was thinking about doing it for men only. Mm-hmm. And I, I went deep into the manosphere. Oh yeah. And it's not a pretty place. It's not a pretty place. It, it really, and actually, it's part of the reason I decided. And the reason I know about it is because they're fans of my work. Ah. So I, yeah, I, yeah, I, they, I, I get, I get reach out on a regular basis. So I, so first of all, I'll say this is like, I actually feel bad for many of the men who mm-hmm. are in the manosphere. I yeah. don't, I don't resent them. I actually think that they, they need sort of more help and better information. Mm. Um, and a different perspective. Yeah. But one of the ideas within the manosphere that I notice is um, this idea of being the alpha. 
Right. Right. So this mm-hmm. sort of alpha male mentality. Yeah, this is why they like my work. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so can, I'm going to give you my view view of this, and then I just I just mm-hmm. want your reaction if mm-hmm. you don't mind, because mm-hmm. this is a personal view, and this is one that I have um, developed in some conversations with with a good friend of mine. And the idea is that this sort of alpha male, um, obviously, it exists very mm-hmm. clearly in the animal kingdom, mm-hmm. and there is great benefits as well as some great cost of mm-hmm. this sort of alpha yep. approach, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. you put yourself at great risk, mm-hmm. you know, you're fighting and so stressed on. out all stressed the time, out all the time. But then you also get this great benefit, which is lots of mates and you know, and this idea of of passing your your genes along. And so some men look at that world and mm-hmm. they say, I need to be more alpha. Mm-hmm. I need to be more alpha. I need to be more alpha. And as I said, in, in the same way that our modern day world is disconnected from that world, mm-hmm. that there are, um, mm-hmm. there are other needs and other considerations. I think that a lot of men hurt themselves because having an alpha mentality, and these are my words, is giving them an incomplete view of masculinity. Mm, yeah, interesting. And I think that that um, while um, there is some benefits to being assertive and confident, mm-hmm. I'll take that as sort of mm-hmm. a, a kind of closely related to alpha, mm-hmm. there's also benefits from being easygoing and sensitive. Mm-hmm. And that there are times when you need to be assertive and confident, right. and there's times when you need to be easygoing and, um, and sensitive. Mm-hmm. And that the... That a man who can have both of those strategies mm-hmm. and move between them as necessary. Mm-hmm. He's the star of all romance novels. He's, he's, not only is his romantic, <laughs> not only is his romantic life is better, but also his social life is better. His work life is better. Mm-hmm. His, his emotional makeup is better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, um, I think a lot of men, uh, would benefit from embracing what might be considered a sort of softer side or more yeah. balanced side right. to that. And I'm just, I just want to get your reaction to that as someone who's thought much, much more about these kind of topics. Yeah. Um, I mean, so th- when I've thought about it, I've thought about it in terms of, you know, what kinds of men can pursue which mate, which mating strategies. And the men who are the more alpha types can potentially have a long-term mate if they wish, or they have the opportunity to just pursue short-term mating mm-hmm. opportunities. Whereas men who are not as clearly higher on the one to 10 scale in whatever mm-hmm. dimension you want to measure. More dominant More style. dominant, yeah. yeah. Um, then, then they cannot. They're just not in demand as much. Um, and, and, and part of the demand comes from this idea of the woman mating up. Um, okay. And so, you know, not only can he... Um, he could secure a long-term mate, but could also could have these short-term mating opportunities if he's higher up in the, in the mating hierarchy. Um, so that's, that's where we've, that's the standpoint that I've come from. Um, just my personal view is, is what ex- exactly what you're saying is true. Um, so if, if somebody is just being hyper masculine and in this, in the way, you know, in this alpha male sort of way, um, but, is so driven to compete and so driven to be at the top of the of the heap that um regardless of context re- yeah regardless yeah. of context and you know that just is you know i mentioned already you know the it's extraordinarily uh, stressful um and i would think that you know and you'd be constantly stabbing others in the back i just think that it would be a really difficult way to live you'd always have one you know you'd always be kind of watching i think watching it would be it, it'd be it'd be difficult to have good strong like Male male friendships yeah, because right. you're you're constantly competing. Mm-hmm. I think it would make it difficult, oftentimes, to be cooperative at work. And a lot of work, especially innovation, requires cooperation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I, yeah, I just uh, so as someone who has um, thought more about masculinity as he's gotten older, and I have I have friends who have this balance, and they really, I think, um, not only they they do well in their dating lives and there are good good partners because they have this sort of flexibility that depending on context and situation to to assert either one or the other 
Yeah, I, I mean, as someone who I, I think I toggle in between a bit. I, I mean, often, often when I'm hanging out with Pete, I'm often I always like, yeah, I'll let Pete be in charge. That's great. <laughs> I don't, I don't mind letting other people, <laughs> be, but I also don't mind like taking charge sure. when I need to in situations. I can certainly like command a room on stage and stuff, and I'm happy to like turn on that muscle when need be. And part of it's been finding a balance of because I think one of the more ridiculous, um, and uh, worst strategies that you can do is to try really hard to be something that you're not. It's often a very false signal. It's often fairly transparent. Mm-hmm. A lot of people kind of tend to, you, you know, put that, put a very defined mask over their insecurity so much so that it only makes them stand out more. Like when we were talking about you and I being lanky and we used to both wear baggy pants yes. to cover up our lanky legs, but it only made it stick out more because <laughs> we're just swimming in these things. And And I think that, you know, much in the same way, like, you know, a bouncer, a big bouncer, usually the nicest guy around. He doesn't need to worry about proving himself to anybody. You know, that's who he is. Uh, Whereas like the uh, short man syndrome is a thing for a reason. You know, they're really trying to prove this thing that they are. And it's just like, you know, if if you there's no reason to not try to be, you know, whatever you want to be in life, but there's still going to be certain things that, that you're naturally going to be, are, are going to be a better strategy for you. Yeah. I think, but, but to, to dive into this just a tiny bit deeper is it's some, it goes something like this. If you have this perspective that being alpha is good, mm-hmm. overwhelmingly good, it can make it difficult to ask for help. Mm-hmm. Right, it can make it difficult for a man mm-hmm. yeah. to the cl- people who he is closest with, whether mm-hmm. it be a a partner or mm-hmm. a friend or a family mm-hmm. member, to say, "I'm really hurting, I'm really uns- uncertain." You know, it's like as I like to say, the patriarchy also oppresses men. Yeah, you know, and so I and and if you want to grow and if you want to be a uh, you know and 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 live a good healthy life, there are going to be times where you just go, "I'm in trouble. I need help. Yeah. I feel weak." Yeah. Or you ac- actually can recognize those weaknesses and then you can course correct. So if you are always having to posture as being being the top guy mm-hmm. and not making any mistakes, then you never then you never have the opportunity to really reflect on where you've been and how to how to get to or where even you say be I next. don't know what to do. Yeah, I I think there's um some interesting lessons of like what makes someone a man and what makes someone an alpha and what makes someone tough that I I think is different than I think being an alpha can be very different than like, you know, Rambo that I grew up watching uh, as a kid or whatever, which is if you, if you look into the world of evolutionary psychology and biology and look at something like say a handicap principle, which is, which is kind of the, the way in which you're advertising your fitness is you're kind of conspicuously putting obstacles in your path. You're incurring costs on yourself in ways and then overcoming those obstacles. So like conspicuous consumption, like buying a fancy car. That's what is like an advertisement of like, Hey, Hey, I have so much money, I can burn it right mm-hmm. in front of you. Um, in that, in that same way, making yourself emotionally vulnerable is actually a very real sign of strength, I think, for many I, men. And this is, this is why this is the, like Marty said, the lead character in every romance novel. Sure, he'll win the fight at the bar, but he can, <laughs> he can also, he can also get sentimental and share his feelings yes. and write poetry. I will say this for the male listeners. I think that, that being vulnerable is an act of courage. And I, because it's, it's, it's in many ways more threatening than getting punched in the face. Especially in a modern age where it's like, no one's actually fighting. And (laughs) and real fights last for like two seconds before they're broken up. Right. So that, so that idea. Um, okay. Last one. And this is for you, Shane. You once told me this is, I think your, this might be your hypothesis about the bringing a lady flowers idea. Oh yeah, we were just talking about this the other day. I, I don't, have you ever seen anyone present this idea, Marty? I don't know. It, it's the the idea is is that I, I was just thinking about why in the world are we bringing people flowers? And I think it's I was, not, yeah, it's not just a lady, but just bringing people flowers. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And I I was kind of just thinking about I I think I was listening to um 
like Steven Pinker's How the Mind Works ages ago or whatever. And he was talking about plants and, and the flowering, uh, you know, that, that means that there's future fruit mm-hmm. going there. And then I was just thinking, well, future fruit also means future mammals going there. And then I was just kind of thinking about it. And so then flowers are this kind of clear sign of future resources. And then I was just thinking like, well, Hunter gather like hunters would way, be and, out and, and inter- about. Wait, hold on, as an interruption. This is exactly the kind of comedic thinking that I find <laughs> so fascinating. Right? It's why I wrote I have this book mm-hmm. coming out, yeah. which is lessons that we can learn from the world of comedy because yeah. comics they just think about and live in the world differently. Yeah, they're just naturally so creative and innovative, mm-hmm. and I just think like this as Shane takes us through his logic mm-hmm. here. Yeah, it's like you get there either through deep deliberation Mm -hmm. that marty does as a scientist (laughs) or this sort of puzzling (laughs) (laughs) i noticed this and then i noticed this okay so yeah and so and i was thinking like well hunters uh, certainly weren't just hunting because there's also it seems like strong evidence that that like bringing meat back from the hunt wasn't like all it was cracked up to be um and and gathering was a bit more important so they would have also been scouting new territory and looking for signs of future growth and i was like oh so then you bring a flower back and then you have this symbol like, of future growth so the guys these. are out but what <laughs> makes guys. it so much better is that one this is something you could do pre-language um potentially you could bring this this back and um what's even a little more clever about it is because you're pulling it from the stem it's like it's something like yeah you know where this is it's like a savings account or something like you you have this resource locked away you you know where the lock box is or whatever and you don't necessarily have to tell or have the capacity to now you hold that information in your mind so now people better to like do what you say or, or follow along or be impressed by you or whatever that commands something if you're someone that's able to bring these regular bouquets that might be that you have a good eye for these these new future areas to inhabit do you have a name for this hypothesis? Uh, no, I'm actually surprised that it's mine. Um, <laughs> well, it might I'm not kind be. of surprised. Uh, yeah, invention. yeah. I mean, every it's time the I think I have for sex hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I every time I think I'm like, oh my god, I just had uh, the, like this great idea that's gonna uh, it's gonna change the way people think, and then I'll like interview someone on a related field about like memory or something like that, and they're like, oh yeah, that's already a studied. Um, yeah, no, no. I mean, someone may have come up with it, which but is kind of nice Marty that I stumbled upon know. it. If I'm, yeah, no, right. I, I have not heard of that before, but I like the idea. Yeah. Hmm. It's a fun one. She, she actually, <laughs> this is, you know, this is a high compliment because at various times, Marty has written down a couple ideas in her notebook, and I'm like, oh, was that something I said? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just something she came up with. Um, well, all right. Well, this is, uh, this has been. As fascinating as I thought it would be, I I recognize that it it doesn't have like the same clear takeaway that some of my previous podcasts have, which are like about nutrition, where you're like, okay, I know exactly what to do now. Oh, Um, I prefer to make life more confusing for people. That's that's mostly the main point of my (laughs) podcast is be like, there oh, there's so much more you need to know than you could ever realize, and yeah, yeah. But what I what I do hope that a listener walks away from with this is that. I'm not sure I can articulate it well. I'll probably do it better in this sort of teaser mm-hmm. for this is while, while these ideas have like great explanatory power mm-hmm. that in many ways, the, the variance in behavior that they can explain has decreased over time. As we move away from our chimps, monkeys, bonobos, apes behavior, mm-hmm. um, and that, that we might have these more proximal goals and, considerations that drive us and that those are okay right that that's that's the idea and that even though the culture and what people what what maybe the average person's beliefs may still be shaped by those that you may be um living your own solo life you be maybe making it remarkable and other people might have trouble recognizing why or how remarkable it may indeed be just because you're walking a different path yeah. I mean, it's going to take forever for our brains to, to evolve and catch up with the modern world. But I think to, to be able to be mindful of these things and be able to free ourselves from some of the 
pressures that were for a cause that has nothing to do with you. I don't give a shit about my genes. No one on earth really gives a shit about their genes being passed on. Like, who cares? Like, most people don't even know what a gene is. Mm -hmm. I I would need to take a genetics course again to really articulate, like, clearly what a gene is. Like, it's not like I care about my genes. I'm not worried about my genes. Who is? And so knowing that your genes are also not caring about you and are also blind in this process um <laughs> maybe you can uh, maybe you can ignore or accentuate some of the things that you like or don't like that that are driven by those genes hmm. That's it's well very said. freeing perspective i like that it is indeed shane i'm glad i invited you along <laughs> <laughs> marty thank you so much for your time no problem My big pleasure. fan of your work thank you and uh Thanks to both of you. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. For more about our guests and show notes,